260. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he lead me, I will follow. Where he lead me, I will follow. Where he lead me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he lead me, I will follow. Where he lead me, I will follow. Where he lead me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Mark 393, 393. And then turn over to the book of Colossians. Lord willing, Brother Billy will be back with you next Wednesday night. But we're going to at least start a few verses here as we get in to the book of Colossians. We've looked at several of Paul's letters, obviously, from Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and now we're in Colossians. Uh, it's pretty much, we know, the same author. And as we look at this and we understand some of the things that Paul is going to do in this letter, uh, he's going to begin praising these Christians. Uh, because he'd heard of their faith and their love, which is something to be praised for. I think we think that we are in a unique time, a time where Jesus is considered insufficient. And yet that's not something that's necessarily a new thing. As a matter of fact, that was an ongoing issue that was taking place at the church at Coloss. I think in the minds of many, uh, they find the message of Jesus is just simply not enough. Uh, we look around us today and we see that apparently that's the attitude of a lot of folks because of all of the things that they try to add to the message of Jesus. All of the things that they add to apart from obviously what the Word of God has to say. And so in their minds, the message of Jesus must not be sufficient. As we talk to those outside of Christ, and I had one of those conversations today, quite lengthy one today, and when you talk to those that are outside of Christ, you realize that apparently the message of Jesus just seemed, doesn't seem to be enough. It's not sufficient. You know, folks want to do what they want to do, and then they want to figure a way that they can justify doing what they want to do. And oftentimes uh, they do that by saying, well, you know, that's, what you, that's the way you interpret it and this is the way I interpret it. But we're both okay, right? Wrong. We both may be wrong in it, but we're not both okay in it. It matters what we believe and it matters what the Bible teaches and it matters whether or not we find the things of Christ and the things of the gospel sufficient or insufficient. And if they are sufficient, then we're going to go by what it says. We're going to model our life, our worship, our salvation after the things of the New Testament. And either that's the pattern that we set or it's not. That's the pattern that we look. So we look to the book of Acts, and that's what we encourage friends and family members that may have a, a different thought and a different perspective on things. They will just look at the book of Acts yourself and tell me how one became a New Testament child of God. 
Look at the scriptures yourself and just the book of Acts and tell me the answer that was given every time the question was asked what one needed to do in order to obtain salvation. And it was asked in a variety of ways. What must I do? Or here's water, what defendeth me? And on and on, Lord, what will thou have me to do? On and on the question was asked, but the answer remained the same. Salvation and being added to the Lord's church did not come before the full spectrum of obedience was taken into consideration. It certainly included the believing process, but it also included repenting, confessing, and being buried and baptized before one could be added to the church. That's not what I think, and it's not what the doctrine of the church proclaimed. That's what the Bible, that's the New Testament. And if we're pattering, pattering our lives and our worship and our who we are after those things, and whether we like it or not, that's what it says. That, that's what we have there. So, a lot of New Age teaching that's there and teaching uh, that's out there to declare that every spiritual path uh, is, is, is in agreement with one another. And we know that's not the case. But everyone has to be embraced and accepted. And, and so churches uh, can add all of these elements of entertainment. They can add all of these elements that they add to their worship and, and so forth. And find that's acceptable again. This is not a new problem for us today. It may be a major problem for us today, but it's not a new problem. And in the first century, the Apostle Paul faced some of these challenges, uh, as we're going to talk about here to the church uh, at Coloss, as he begins to establish, you must have a foundation of faith. If you've got that foundation of faith, then you're not going to start looking at things and saying, well, I know the Bible says this, but I like doing it this way. I know the Bible teaches this, but we'd rather do it like this. And on and on the excuses go. And I, I heard them today and I've heard them pretty much all of my life, especially in full-time preaching of folks making excuses for why they did things followed patterns, followed things that were contrary to what they could read for themselves in the scriptures. Whether it was because of family, whether it was because that's just the way they've always done it, whatever it may have been, they all have excuses for why it's done in the manner that, in the way that it's done. So again, Paul is going to address some of these things and most of all, he's going to show the supremacy of Christ. That's what we're going to see. Much like just about all of the books and letters that we read about in the New Testament, it's Christ is superior to the law. Christ is superior to this. Christ is superior. Anything that you look at, Christ is superior. And when we talk about his supremeness, his sufficiency for life, so when we look at the focal point here in Colossians, what is it that makes Christ great? We, we already know the answer to that, those of us that are here tonight. But there may be those that are listening or there may be those around that still haven't quite been able to grasp on and understand what is it that makes him so great. Uh, a lot of folks know what they've heard and uh, from others and so forth, but they haven't really been able to acknowledge that themselves. Much like, remember Jesus asking, whom do men say that I am? Until we grasp that answer personally. It's not so much what everybody else says, what do you say? That's what really matters, isn't it? Because when all's said and done, and we're bowing before the judgment seat of Almighty God, it's what I have said. It's what I have done. Not what you or anyone else or my church or my elders or my preacher or whoever it may be. It's what I have said to whom Christ is. And that's what we're going to see when we look at this knowledge and realize how it is very changing to us. The first two verses, let's look at that start with where he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are Colos, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christ. So, the first thing that we see revealed, obviously, is who this letter is from. Uh, we don't have to do a whole lot of research. We don't have to wonder about the authorship. He comes out as is the case in most, of, if not all of his writings, to let us know that he's an apostle and he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's important because Jesus Christ would be considered to be what? An apostle of God. He's that messenger, he's that one from, but, but, but Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that. And it's sent from Timothy and P Timothy, of course, we've talked about him being Paul's traveling companion uh, and a preacher of the gospel. Uh, and he's writing to the uh, faithful uh, in the city of Colos. Uh, saints uh, are not dead people. We've ta already talked about that and identified when we talk about to the saints, we're not talking about dead folks. Wouldn't be a whole lot of reason to be writing to them. Wouldn't be a whole lot of reason trying to encourage them or get them to do anything. So we know that the world has taken the word saint or saints and has misapplied it like the religious world does with so many things. But they certainly have done that here. Saints has to do with those that have been born again, those that are in Christ Jesus. I know it's difficult sometimes for us to say that we consider ourselves saints. I've heard well-meaning Christians Sometimes use the phrase, well, I'm no saint, but, well, if you're a child of God, yes, you are. You are a saint. So we've got to, like so many things, we've got to be careful that we don't let the world define for us a biblical term instead of letting the Bible define for us the biblical term. And that's what we see as you began here uh, in this letter uh, as he's writing this. Uh, in this way. So a saint, any person, holy, faithful, and has been obedient to God. So he begins praising these Christians. Uh, he says in verse 3, we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So Paul thanks God that these folks are who they are. They're doing what they're doing. Uh, we Studied this morning from the book of Philemon. Doesn't take long to study from that book. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's one that we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago and we talked about this morning that's probably not talked about all that much. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a hard book to find in the New Testament because we're not accustomed to going over the book of Philemon. But God put that there like he has in every book of the Bible. There's a reason, there's a purpose for that book. But Paul spends the first few verses in that book telling Philemon what a great individual he is and what a faithful child of God he is before he brings down what it is that he wants to address and that is of course this slave on Cyprus that has went away and has come to him and has been baptized and now Paul's sending him back and saying listen forgiveness is the key to that book. And, and, and that's what you see as you read that book. But as he praises these Christians, he's building them up. And, and we need to do that to one another. We need to build one another up, even when there's problems, even when there's difficulty. We, we need to build one another up. We need to find that common area, that area where we can encourage one another, provoke one another to love and good works. Look at what they are exhibiting here. Look at the faith that they have. Faith is something that, even when you look over to James's book, faith is something that demands a change. It demands a change then and it demands a change now. And if our faith hasn't caused any kind of change to occur in our life, then is it really the kind of faith that's going to sustain us through this life and get us to the next life safely? So they're showing love for all of the holy people of God. They're showing this genuine faith. Paul acknowledges that. 
And I think the bottom line is our faith is demonstrated on how we treat one another. You know, that was a key that we looked at also this morning. It all boils down to that, that when Jesus was asked the greatest commandment and he, was, he said, love the Lord thy God, but the second one was love thy neighbor, and which the law and the prophets hang upon those two things. And the reason that the law and the prophets hang upon those two things is because, again, if we love God, we do what he says. If we love our fellow man, we do nothing that would bring harm to them. We want, we want only the best for them. And so over and over again in the epistles and in the, in the writings, we see that talked about again and again and again. That idea that we need to have that love for God and that our faith in Christ is revealed by how we treat one another and how we worship God and how we respect and reverence God and how we uh, love one another and so forth. And we can't claim to love God, but yet we don't love the Lord. Or we can't claim to love the Lord and we don't love one another. And how these all go hand in hand. And so this is what we find as he is declaring these things as we go on through that first verse. Verse 4, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you've also learned of uh, Epaphras, our, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared uh, unto us your love in the Spirit. So, he continues on there in establishing not only the love that they had, but continuing to show us the foundation of their faith and the foundation of, of what it's going to take for us to be able to sustain and go through the things that we're going to go through. And hope is a big reason for their faith and love. And if we're going to succeed and make it, it's going to be a big reason for our faith and love. Hope. We don't think about that word much, but we certainly, I think, use it a lot in our life. There's a lot of things that we hope for. There's a lot of things that we put our faith in. And these things tend to go hand in hand. They uh, have this faith, they have this love because of the hope reserved for them in heaven. And that goes for us as well. We might think Paul has it mixed up a little bit here. We might have the tendency to believe that faith is the basis of the hope that we have in heaven. But he says that our hope in heaven is the basis for our faith. And the basis for loving others. When we think about hope, isn't it what holds up our faith? Isn't it what holds up our love, that expectation, that hope? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Isn't that what sustains us to go through the things in this life that we've gone through and that we will continue to go through? The older that, that we become, the more problems that we tend to have. Isn't it that hope that's going to sustain us? Even in those final hours and those final breaths, isn't it that hope that's going to sustain us? I mean, faith is important. Love is important. But you've got to have that hope. We've got to have something to hold on to and, and something, uh, I think, uh, not only to hold on to, something to look forward to. Don't we all want something to look forward to? Whether it's something of an earthly nature, that's nice. When we can plan something or look forward to something that's coming up, a celebration or whatever it may be, and we look forward to that or a trip, whatever it might be. But think that on a grander scale when it comes to that looking forward to that day that we can spend eternity. That's a long time, folks. Eternity. Because we're going to spend it somewhere. And we're going to spend it in the presence of, spend it in the, presence of the Father or we're going to spend it in the presence without the Father, in a place that we don't want to be. 
And so that has to do, and that's up to us when we look at that now. So, so many, I think maybe at Coloss and even today, are struggling uh, with their faith. Uh, some have lost hope. And because they've lost hope, they've lost their faith. See, if they still had hope, their faith would still be there. But they've lost hope, they've lost their faith. And they no longer look to heaven. They no longer think about that place that's reserved for them because they've lost hope. Well, he hadn't come yet. You know, that was something that occurred in Bible time as well. Well, he hadn't showed up yet, so he must not be going to come. Folks, whether he comes in your lifetime or not, ready or not, you're going to meet him. You're going to meet him. And so it's easy for us to focus on life right now, and it's, we, we don't want to dwell on the fact of death. No one wants to dwell on that, the unexpected or the unknown. And so we want to focus on the here and now. But see, the, the devil wants us to make sure that we continue to focus on that, and we don't think about anything else. That way... We won't get our life where it needs to be and keep our life where it needs to be. So when we think about all these things, we think about what's going to happen, what's going to become of us. So many lose their faith because they lose the eternal perspective. They don't think about that. They think about it when they're forced to think about it. They think about it when certain things happen with other individuals and they just have to think about it. But they, that eternal perspective, we, we just don't want to dwell on that. That's a long time. It doesn't end. And so we forget sometimes the way we're living, the way we're serving, and the calling as we've been talking about on Sunday morning. It, it can't be an empty calling, folks. It's got to be a calling that's worthy and one that's so important. So putting the interest of others ahead of ourselves, looking at that hope that's reserved for us in heaven, devoting ourselves to God, it may not be the common thing for folks to do in the world today, but it better be what those in the church understand need to be done. And... And I think all of that kind of helps us realize how foolish it is when we put our hope in the things of this world. We're warned against that in the scriptures. We have to live in the world, but we can't be of the world. John warns us against all of these things. We see the warnings, and it's repeated over and over again, maybe from a different perspective, but it's still the same message. Don't put your hope in the things that aren't going to do you one bit of good. Jesus said, lay it up in heaven, your treasure, not on earth. See, it'd be foolish to put all of your eggs in one basket right here on earth. So that, that's the foolishness that the Bible speaks of over and over again. Whether it's from Paul, whether it's from Jesus, it's the same message. Don't put your hope in the things of this world. The things of this world are temporary. We are temporary in this world. Uh, we know that something's going to happen one day, and we know that it's going to come whether the Lord returns first or whether we go to meet Him. It's going to happen. The next thing that pops up is then what? Then what? What happens at that point? Where am I going? What am I going to do? I have my hope reserved for me already in heaven. See, I already know what I'm going to do, don't I? You know, when we make a reservation, we've got a pretty good idea of what we're going to do, don't we? The problem is there's not a lot of folks putting their hope and reserving their hope in heaven, and so they really don't know, what am I going to do? Well, I can tell you what's going to happen if you don't have that reserved. <laughs> it's not a very pretty picture. Not a very pretty picture. If I have that hope reserved, then I have a reason for faith and a reason for loving others. I have a reason for living. Sometimes folks look for that. They say, well, I, I, don't, I don't even know what my purpose or my reason for being here is. This is it right here. This is what we're going to study in the book of Colossians as we look at this. A reason for pressing on. A reason for the suffering and the pain. Not only our own, but suffering and pain of watching loved ones. What's the reason for it? And we 
we look to this and we're going to see more and more of that as we go through the book of Colossians because it's very clear. God doesn't want us to get overly comfortable with where we are. It's all right to enjoy what we've been blessed with and who we've been blessed with, but it was always meant to be just a temporary thing. We're all terminal. And when we truly understand that, it can wrap our head around that. Then we truly will understand that we have the things reserved in heaven. That's where our hope's going to be. That's where our hope has to be. Faith and love are the fruits of this hope that's reserved for us in heaven. So, if we don't have that hope reserved for us in heaven, then you could use the word hopeless, and that would be appropriate. Hopeless. Because we don't have that hope. We could. We could. You know, everybody uh, that's living right now has that invitation. They have the opportunity. But if we don't have it, then the only other thing that we can have is hopelessness. Paul tells us that we've heard about this hope in the message of the truth and the gospel that has come to us. It comes from the message of the gospel that we've received, but we've got to hold on to it. We've got to understand the message of the gospel is all about this hope, this hope that will sustain us, this hope that will help us to love one another like we should. We want to have faith and hope. But the problem is sometimes we want that faith or hope, but we don't want to put the work into it that we need to to have that faith and hope. We want it as easy as possible. And we don't want to get, put any effort forth sometimes. Just... Give me that faith and hope, but I don't want to do anything. But we talk about building our hope in the song on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, don't we? And that, that's really what our hope is built upon. And, and it takes an effort if we're going to have that. Look for all these avenues and all of these things and, that we find in the Word of God. We're not going to have hope if our faith is weak. If we access the word of God only when we come together like this, then it's going to be extremely easy to just have that weak faith. A faith that's not going to sustain us. And understanding certainly that the gospel is the power for bearing fruit. The message of truth, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. Just as it has bore fruit and cause growth in the Christians at Colossus. The message of Jesus will do the exact same thing today that it did for those in the early church. But it's going to take an effort. And it's going to take a desire on our part. So I think some of the final things that we can catch really from these verses, first eight verses, is to build up our hope and strengthen our faith. That's what he's starting off with these brethren at Kola before he gets into some of the issues and some of the difficulties and why their faith needs to be so strong and why they have to put their hope. It can't be in just wishful thinking. Well, I hope I'm going to make it. I hope I'm going to succeed. I, I hope it, It's got to be more than just wishful thinking. It's got to be based on something. It's got to be based on someone. And, and uh, we often talk about hope in a way that we actually mean that we're wishing for something. That, that's not really the hope that we're looking for. We not just don't sit here and wish our way into heaven. Hope has more of a, a grand expectation. God's going to do what God has promised to do, but we've got to do what we have set forth to do as well. And what the scripture has said. Love is the fruit of hope. The gospel is the message of truth. And so when we finally ask the question, well, what's so great about Jesus? Or we try to answer the question, what's so great about Jesus? It's because who do you think brought us the hope in the first place? That's the answer that we give, folks. What's so great about this Jesus that you speak of? Well, where do you think the hope comes from? 
Where do you think the heavenly reservation, the heavenly expectation, where do you think all that comes from? It comes from Jesus. That's where the hope is. He's the reason we have hope. He died for those who have faith in him. And when we talk about what happens next, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing, folks. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Because next, when we pass away, there's no fear. There's no problem. Because we have that hope, we have that expectation of that heavenly home. Any other thoughts you might like to add before we sing our invitation tonight? So those that are here and those that are listening, where's your hope? Where's your expectation? It may very well be in the things of this world. We let a lot of things take us away. We let the things of the world, we let, and, and, the, and the devil's going to constantly try to put things before you that will distract you from your salvation, will distract you from your hope. But the world's not going to give you anything that you need when it comes to eternal salvation. That's only going to be found in Jesus Christ. So if we can help you achieve that tonight, we want to. If you'll come, let us know while together we stand and sing 393. <clears throat> off we come together. Off we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy day. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we Y'all have a good rest of the week. Lord willing, Brother Larry Sweeney will be here Sunday morning. I know y'all will enjoy his lesson and make him feel welcome. So. Would you bow with me as we dismiss in prayer? Yes. Okay, John 1, 16, next Wednesday night will be the lesson beginning. John chapter 1, beginning verse 16. Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful that you've given us the privilege of being together. But most of all, that you have given us your son, realizing that that sacrifice that he made and that sacrifice that you made, that he willingly went to the cross, that you offered your son and he willingly went. We thank you for that shed blood, but we're so sorry that he had to go through the pain and suffering that he went through. But we thank you so much that he was willing to do that so that we can have that hope that expectation of eternal life. Father, pray that you'll go with us from here tonight and that you will keep us safe. Give us a safe drive home and a, a good night's rest. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.